from time immemorial, humanity has pondered perhaps the biggest question of all. How did life begin? Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. The answer to this question has tested the bounds of science and even sometimes bordered on metaphysics. In fact, one of the most famous investigations into the origin of life is the Miller-Urey experiment, which attempted to simulate the conditions of the purported primordial Earth. It succeeded in creating proto-organic amino acids from inorganic compounds, electricity, heat, and other ingredients. This result is controversial, but it's cute to note that it had a connection to where I am right now at UC San Diego. In fact, the URI is related to URI Hall, who is the namesake of our chemistry department here at UC San Diego. Now, don't get too excited. I'm not going to speculate and say I believe I understand the answer to it as a cosmologist. I will point out, however, that it's one of my favorite chicken or egg type questions, and maybe even relates to the so-called great debates that I speak about in losing the Nobel Prize. Namely, the great debate center around how central humanity is in the organization of our solar system, of our galaxy, maybe of our universe, and perhaps the multiverse, as this video over here took us and explored. But today I'm raising another chicken or egg type question, just as mysterious. Which came first, the literal chicken or the egg, namely the genetic material or the organism that produces the organic chemistry that we then sprung forth. Now, an intrinsic component of the mystery of life is why do the building blocks of life exhibit a property, a type of symmetry or asymmetry known as chirality or handedness? Most living things exhibit bilateral symmetry, such as the fact that your left half and your right half look mainly identical or the wings of a bird have a two-fold symmetry. Or there might be a five-fold symmetry in a sea star, and maybe an eight-fold symmetry in a spider. Now, since you can flip a symmetrical object about a mirror axis, and it looks the same with respect to left and right handedness, then you might wonder if there's anything intrinsically important about the fact that life is based upon building blocks which themselves are chiral. From where does this chirality emerge? Chiral objects do not superimpose properly when flipped. Your right hand and your left hand exhibit this property of symmetry apparently, but you can't put a right hand into a left-handed glove, even if you flip it around backwards. Chiral asymmetry occurs at the molecular scale too. A molecule can have the same atoms, the same two-dimensional and three-dimensional structure, but if flipped one way versus the other way, it cannot be superimposed. The two molecules are called anathemars, or opposite images. A very famous example of such a molecule is the drug called thalidomide. It is an example of a chiral molecule that was once used to treat nausea in women during pregnancy. The right-hand molecular version, or isomer, of this particular compound, thalidomide, did just that. It cured nausea. But the right-handed version also led to horrific birth defects. If you're watching this and you're alive, then you're a living organism that is replete with chiral molecules. Not only is it true of molecular structure, but it can be true down to the helical structure of ribonucleic acid and DNA as well. These can twist to the right or to the left with equal probability, and yet the helix of DNA of living organisms on Earth turn only to the right, sometimes called the live direction. The bioavailable sugars that are used in the consumption for molecular energy are also right-handed. And in fact, that is exploited sometimes for certain weight loss products as well. This chirality of molecules and even of RNA and DNA has fascinated some of the greatest scientific minds of all time, including Louis Pasteur, who was one of the first to observe it. Legendary chemist and writer Primo Levi had a lifelong fascination with this question. What is it about the universe that created handedness in life itself on Earth? We know of no other organisms throughout the universe that have DNA that we could compare, so perhaps it's a one-off effect, but perhaps it is a constituent of the building blocks of matter itself. Could the riddle of life's chirality 
be hidden or related to the nature of chirality in elementary particle physics? Well, the first clue could be in the nature of that perpetual annoyance, dust. Now, dust seems to fascinate me, and it is the villain of my book, Losing the Nobel Prize, but it is not the dust that seems to spontaneously regenerate on your furniture, drag by your toddler, or feature prominently in pictures from the Voyager satellite, the famous pale blue dot image that Carl Sagan commanded the Voyager 1 spacecraft to take on Valentine's Day, 1990. But some of the dust falls to Earth, and some of that dust from micrometeorites coming from our solar system contains traces of amino acids. And some of these amino acids on the dust that falls to Earth have more content, more versions, and more examples of left-handed versions of amino acids. Radio telescopes like this one have detected chiral molecules in deep space. So these images reveal properties of chirality throughout our known universe, and yet we only have one example, the so-called right-handed helix of DNA on Earth, on the only living systems that we know about. Now, asymmetries are also present at the foundations of physics, at the highest energies that emanate in our cosmos. Could these chiral differences in the fundamental nature of elementary particles influence the formation of chirality in molecules and even DNA on Earth? So one of the earliest links to life on Earth, as I said, and the chiral nature of molecules was observed by Louis Pasteur one of the first scientists to recognize the asymmetry. Li and Yang in the 1950s predicted a certain fundamental force called the weak force would be chiral. So-called CP violation takes place, and it was famously observed by Madame C.S. Wu later on, just a few years later, at Columbia University. I study the CMB, the cosmic microwave background, the remnant ancient fossil heat left over from the formation of the elements, emanating from a time when hydrogen first formed in the early universe after the Big Bang. This fossil light can exhibit a type of chirality violation as well, and asymmetry is revealed by its polarization. And in fact, one of the goals of the Simons Observatory that I co-lead is to detect the subtle swirl with profound implications in cosmology. Not the ordinary B-mode signal that would be indicative of an early inflationary event that we spoke about in this video, but an actual CP violation in the early universe as traced by the so-called forbidden polarization patterns that I talked about with Sean Carroll in this video here. Recently, two astrophysicists, including Naomi Globus, a high-energy astrophysicist at New York University and the Center for Computational Astrophysics in the Flatiron Institute, who teamed up with Roger Blanford, a fellow astrophysicist at Stanford, and theorized that cosmic rays may explain the biological homochirality or the preference for right-handedness via the phenomenon of the four fundamental forces of nature. We talk about familiar forces like gravity and electromagnetism all the time. We experience them every day via electromagnetic light or gravity when you drop something. But there are also two other forces that are much less familiar that at different energies are expected to unify with these two other lower energy forces, including the strong atomic force, which binds nuclei together, and the weak force, which is responsible for radioactive decay. Now, it turns out that the weak force exhibits chirality. So when cosmic rays break up in the atmosphere of Earth, they produce particles called pions. Pions slamming into the atmosphere produce showers of particles, including electrons, and their heavier siblings called muons, all of which are driven and impacted by the chiral weak force. Globus and Blanford theorized that over millennia, the effect on molecules may have been to impact right-handed ones just a bit more than their evil, sinister left-handed ones just to drive evolution slightly more in that direction. However, not everybody agrees with this assumption. Take Professor Lee Cronin, the Regius Professor at the University of Glasgow, a renowned chemist and inventor. He has this to say about the globus Blanford proposal. Um, chirality is a really interesting phenomena. Obviously, when we're talking about fundamental particles, chirality is an intrinsic feature of uh, many of these. Um, and the individual particle can be seen as a function of its spin associated, you can call these chiral. When we're talking about molecules, however, it's a little bit different. I'm a chemist, so a molecule for me is a collection of atoms held together by strong interactions that we might call bonds. And those bonds um, are typically hard to break. 
So that means when I stick atoms together and I do it, let's just imagine I was doing it precisely like an architect, those atoms would, generally speaking, their rotation and, and movement, but the relative orientation or position, if you like, of the atoms with regard to each other. And when you're able to put atoms together in a molecule um, using covalent bonds, organic chemists typically would draw these molecules. And under certain conditions, if you have a number of at different atoms around a central molecule, you could call that a chiral center. You also can have chiral uh, planes. So molecules can be chiral with respect to the atom, twisted. So there's two really interesting schools of thought. There are people that are going to look for life in the universe. And one, one signature that people are saying might be really interesting is to look for a chiral excess. A large chiral excess has been postulated to be a unique signature for life. There's another school which says, okay, um, for life to emerge, one of the critical ingredients we need is a chiral excess. So we have to have a chiral excess before life is started, before the origin. And so we have this classic problem built here. Is life chiral uh, because of the stuff at the beginning or is life able to produce chirality from a ostensibly racemic world or perhaps a world where there's just a very slight excess. I would argue that actually life produces chirality. In fact, life doesn't even need an excess. Indeed, it's clear that there are excesses of chiral molecules found in meteorites. People have made a conjecture that maybe the irradiation of the interstellar medium via circularly polarized light or some other uh, circular polarized UV light probably would cause de selective decomposition of one hand of the molecules with respect to the other. But it's not clean, it's a small amount, but nevertheless, it appears to be a, a, a fairly sound um, observation. Now go into the lab, coupled with the, the observation that chemists have found, that they are able to seed experiments, which normally would produce you know, a racemic outcome. But if you seed it and you put in slight excess, you can bias that, particularly if there's catalysis, and I'm gonna, to try and suggest that the that life produces chirality. And actually, chirality is probably an emergent property in physics. It is a natural thing that comes out of how uh, matter interacts in space. For chirality to be an emergent phenomena, when you have networks of interacting molecules, then at some point, when it starts interacting in the environment, the selection occurs. That selection starts to produce chiral structure. Having a consistent twist on those on the building blocks would allow the polymer, seems to give the polymers the ability to fold into objects. And those objects have more stability because they're all complementary, the helices fit together, and it's really rather nice. And you have a way of getting to a very complex um, configuration in space without having to search all the space. So what I'm saying is that chirality is produced by selection, and as selection starts to kind of boot up, that you start to store information, that is you start to record the, the presence in the environment. And that information storage needs chirality to search a higher dimensional space to get advantage. And that's where life produces chirality. Chirality is not on off, it is the accretion of information through selection. And we need to think about it in that more uh, nuanced way. Stay tuned for a special interview with Professor Cronin following this video's airing. In the tradition of Miller and Urey, David Dreamer, a biochemist at the University of California, Santa Cruz, has designed an apparatus developed to mimic the conditions on the early Earth. And he plans to test the cosmic ray theory by bombarding a bacterial colony of microbes with beams of chiral electrons or muons and determine if that will result in preferred mutations. What we're trying to do in the laboratory is to simulate a process that we think was very common on the early Earth. And it's still common today, in fact. Whenever rain falls on a volcano, it, it makes little puddles that are heated by the volcanic energy. In the laboratory, we are simulating that by building a chamber. The chamber has got to be anaerobic, meaning there can't be any air in it. And every vial that is embedded in this disk, and there's 24 of them, 
goes through one wet dry cycle every 90 minutes. We're drying it out under a stream of carbon dioxide. We're rehydrating with just plain old water. Then it goes through another drying cycle. This occurs every 90 minutes. And in a typical experiment, we'll have about four of these cycles in a day that we will then analyze the result and see what we've made, if anything. Luca Legignani of the Blackman Laboratory here in San Diego at the Scripps Institute is pursuing another research path demonstrating how very small initial chiral changes can drive a dominant form of chirality under lab conditions that are thought to mimic evolutionary processes. Click here for that video to learn more about Luca's experiment. So the big question of how life began may remain a mystery for now, but the twisted nature of the universe may be hinting to a direction that's worth pursuing. I'm Brian Keating, Chancellor's Distinguished Professor of Physics and co-director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, thanking you for watching this episode of Into the Impossible. Stay tuned for more great conversations. <laughs>